why do we need cloudless compute? This is why we need it. I don't know, hopefully everyone here knows what this image is, but maybe not. This is an image generated by Google Gemini um, about a, a week ago. This is the um, Google's um, image uh, generation AI. And they've basically manipulated the algorithm to make it as diverse as possible. And so when someone put in a request for 1943 German soldier, you get this absurd image of a diverse you know, Nazi army, which is both offensive and also massively historically incorrect and wrong in basically every possible dimension. And this is what happens when you have corporate centralized AI. The AI is manipulated to solve for certain goals. And it's manipulated behind the scenes in ways you do not know. You cannot, you don't know when you're putting your words in there what the manipulation is until you get the text. Now luckily for us, it's so absurd and so clumsy, we can tell exactly what it is and what the agenda is. But you know, you can tell Mark Andreessen has been very vocal about this and his point is, Tech AI and censorship is only gonna get worse. It's bad now, two years will be worse, two years later it'll be worse, and two years later it'll be worse after that. And that's why we need cloudless compute. Because we should have open, decentralized AI. That will be more trusted, ultimately. You wanna have AI which is trained on data, verifiably, it's provably. You wanna prove the queries were executed with no um, with no manipulation, and you want to be able to run decentralized. You want to run decentralized because otherwise you're subject to manipulation by and pressure from shareholders, from management, from employees, from regulators, from politicians, from Twitter bot armies. So cloudless compute is required. Now what is cloudless compute? It's true decentralized compute, and that means it's got to be fault tolerant and verifiable. And fault tolerant means that if something goes down, it, if a server goes down, if a data center goes down, the compute automatically moves to the next provider. It moves seamlessly. And it's gotta be verifiable, meaning you can verify and validate that your computations were performed. So you end up with a network that's global, always on, and self-healing from downtime, and isn't controlled by any entity. That's cloudless compute. Let's take a second on and why you want it. You want it because it's secure, no single point of failure, distributed, no point of censorship. It's cheaper, up to 80% less. And I'm gonna get into a little bit more detail as to why that is the case. Um, and it's verifiable, we've talked about that already. And it's green, and this is interesting, because it's a global network, you have a variety of criteria you can choose. And so you can choose to have your compute only run green if you so choose, which means it only will run or only select data centers that are fully renewable. So um, that I think is a, um, something obviously the centralized cloud um, with AWS doesn't, doesn't offer. Um, and who is it running on? Well, this is the list of partners that are with the Fluence launch and our early data center partners. You know, we're partnering with data centers that are kind of top tier around the world. This represents um, Australia, New Zealand, India, US, Canada, um, and Europe as well. And some of these data centers are, we visited some of them in, in the US. You know, these are the same centers that are running um, compute for Netflix, for um, Facebook, et cetera. So top tier centers. And Fluence right now, there's interest in having 4,000 servers with over 200,000 cores to deploy on Fluence. Now we're not deploying all those right away, we'll deploy those over time and scale it up. But that's the level we're talking about. And on top of this, every day we have more inbound interest of individuals, big companies and small companies interested in having their compute join our network. So this is a terrific, um, you know, top-notch starting place, and we're gonna scale to be fully permissionless on this in the next several months. Let's talk about what isn't cloudless, though. What isn't cloudless is just a, a marketplace of compute, all right? And there's a lot of marketplaces of compute out there. But guess what? I can look on my desktop or my laptop and choose a provider. That does not make it decentralized, all right? You need to have resiliency which means that if you choose something and it goes down, it goes automatically to the next one without reprovisioning. 
Otherwise, it's not really a network. It's just you choosing a provider. That doesn't count. And you also need verifiability, but finally, you need cloud services. And what do cloud services mean? Because that's, that's a very important point. You know, the hardware marketplace is important, but hardware is not where the value really is. I think most people here are, everyone's here is in software. We kind of know the value is in software. And so pure hardware marketplace isn't where value is. It comes from all the services built on top. AWS is successful not because it has a lot of data centers, but because it's built a stack of usable software on top of it that people use. And so we are very cognizant of that and have built a stack of software on top of our marketplace as well that um, mimics that cloud marketplace and that allows the um, composition and creation of natively distributed applications from the beginning. And I think it's the first one to do that. It covers the composition and execution of decentralized applications. And that is very important. Otherwise, you're just a hardware marketplace. And I don't think that's very interesting. So what then are the benefits if you have this, both this decentralized marketplace and you have this stack of software on top of it? We've talked about verifiability. We've talked about censorship resistant. But we haven't talked about the low cost, really, and the buildable. So low cost, why is it so much cheaper? And it's cheaper because when you have no switching costs, then there is no benefit, there's no leverage on the part of the compute provider. If someone raises prices, you can switch out easily. Someone joins the network with lower prices, you switch to them quickly. And so there is, you've actually commoditized compute. And that is a big thing to be able to do. But to do that, you have to have the resiliency. You have to be confident that you can switch um, with no cost and no latency. So that low cost means that the compute providers aren't going to be making high margins here. The margins here are way smaller than what they currently earn, but as long as they are using compute and that they're not otherwise deploying, as long as they're covering the cost of electricity, that's a net benefit to them and they don't care. The other point is Fluence is, a, has, is offering serverless compute. That is an offering that's more complex than just renting hardware, and data centers can't offer that either. So there's a new product they're offering, and new customers coming to them for a price that is lower maybe than their traditional customers, but is fulfilling demand they don't otherwise have. That is where we get low cost. That's why it's sustainable, and that's why this will be far lower than any centralized cloud cost. And buildable, this is also important. As um, you run, because it's a decentralized network, you can build on an application, you can build on a module, and as long as any computer anywhere in the world has demand to serve that, it still exists. So I can build an application, and the, the pieces I use can be subject to 10 upgrades, but I'm not forced into those upgrades. If I build an Amazon, if I build somewhere else, I gotta keep upgrading, keep that upgrade cycle going, things might break, I've gotta reintegrate, et cetera. Here, I build on something, and as long as I keep paying the provider that's hosting it, it keeps running, right? So I can build with confidence and not be subject to kind of the forced upgrade cycles that um, so many um, um, software companies go through. So let's talk about some uses. We've talked about AI, and I think just to go a little bit more into detail on this, you wanna verify the data, the, the compute was trained, the AI was trained on particular data. You may have seen the New York Times sued um, OpenAI, ChatGPT, claiming their data was used in, that, um, in training that model. So we think that most models going forward are gonna to wanna to be able to prove what data they were trained on. And that is something that a, you don't need a GPU to do that. That's data pipeline, that can be trained on CPUs. Um, also, you wanna be run decentralized. Again, running the model and running the queries is a CPU job, not necessarily a GPU job. Um, which is important is what we do. And you also want to make sure it's auditable. You want to have auditable compute here so you can prove that um, the query was executed and, and was, was done without any manipulation. Also really, really vital. And so beyond um, AI though, what are other use cases? Well, there's all of Web3. And if we think of Web3, first, obviously, there's DeFi. DeFi is fully decentralized. We're not going to even debate that. But outside of DeFi, everything is running on the cloud. And it's nobody's fault. It's just that there hasn't been any viable alternatives. 
And Infura is a perfect example. It's running on AWS. But now there's an ability to decentralize that. And we've, we've, we're going to see more and more and more critical components of Web3 decentralized. Nobody wants to be centralized, but there haven't been easy ways to do that historically. And that is, that is now changing. And I think we'll, we all recognize with the... Um, you know, with the, uh, the, the kind of regulatory environment, the risks we all are running by having AWS kind of out there subject to um, influence by regulators. And I think that is something that we want to get out of the way of as quickly as we can. But beyond Web3, there is the serverless market, right? And, and serverless market's $9 billion right now, which is big, but that's growing to $55 billion by 2030. What is serverless? You want episodic, price-sensitive compute. That's really what it is. And some examples of that, which you heard in the video, are you know, pharma analysis, where you're doing long, intensive data, but it's not really time-sensitive, so it's price-sensitive. That's perfect for a far lower-cost solution like Fluence. Um, you also, machines like cars, huge amounts of data generated and want to be processed at the edge. Also a perfect serverless opportunity. And sports, you know, you have... Um, massive, more and more data generated, whether it's, whether it's F1, whether it's football matches, whatever it is, data, more and more data is generated, and that needs to be analyzed and, and completed at that time very quickly, and then there's no need for that data or no need for analyzing for some more period after that. So this is what serverless is for, and this is what Fluence can do very well, um, and that's how big we think this, this can go. And that's why we think that Fluence and serverless cloudless is the next generation of the internet. We started off with mainframes and desktops. That moved to the cloud, and that was a long transition. The cloud is still growing. It's still growing significantly. But cloudless, the basically commoditization of compute, is that next generation. And that is probably the final generation where compute is commoditized and is easy and open for everybody to use and for everybody to build on. And by the way, I'm not saying the cloud goes away. It doesn't, but this becomes a viable alternative to the cloud and a viable alternative on which all of these deep in projects we've been talking about can also run on with confidence without having to rely on AWS. And how do you govern a network like this? Well, we haven't talked much about governance today. But a network like this should be governed in a decentralized way as well. It doesn't make sense to have a decentralized network that's governed as a company, right? All of a sudden, there's a massive disconnect. So this should be governed by a DAO. And so from the beginning, Fluence needs to be governed by a DAO. And we'll be talking about that later. So how do we think about this in sort of the bigger picture context of the world? Well, we think open platforms, you know, obviously inspire innovation and they also capture value. And we've seen this happen with Ethereum. Ethereum has a lot of uses. Um, DeFi is a terrific one and probably one of the, and probably the largest for Ethereum. And so it's to some extent a open banking alternative and that continues to grow. Um, you know, it's worth a massive amount, 400 billion, and the global banking world is 14 trillion. We view Fluence in the same context, but as an alternative to the cloud. And so the cloud market is over 600 billion right now, growing dramatically to the multi-trillions. And an open, cloudless platform should also be um, should also generate and capture a lot of value. But where does that value go? The value doesn't go to shareholders. It doesn't go to um, to uh, you know to 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 the it goes it goes to users and it goes to, if you're architected correctly, to token coin holders who are both validators, users, and um, in the community. And so that's where this value goes. That's where the Ethereum value has gone, right? It's, not, it's going to the people who've built, believed in, and contributed to Ethereum. That's what, what we think will happen with Fluence as well. So um, what is our mission? We want to empower the next wave of internet innovation. And I want to you know, basically end with a quote from Tim Berners-Lee, who created the HTTP protocol on which the entire web that we know has been built. And TBL, as you know, did not know, couldn't imagine Uber, couldn't imagine Google Maps, couldn't imagine the things that created that the HTTP protocol um, inspired. But he knew that if he created a platform like this, innovation would follow. 
And similarly at Fluence, we feel that if we create a cloudless platform that where there's no, where there's no switching costs with open compute um, that is inexpensive, verifiable, that will inspire a terrific amount of innovation as well. And that's what our mission is, is we want to inspire this innovation and drive forward the next phase of the internet. So with that, I thank you. And um, um, we'll be on and um, appreciate, uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs>